Boeing, the aviation giant, is seemingly falling apart, or at least its planes are. Hello, my friends, Takuya here, and welcome back to the History of Everything podcast YouTube channel. And on today's episode, we're going to be diving into something that is both very dangerous and simultaneously very interesting. I promised you, I promised you all that we were going to be getting into the whole Boeing controversy and the disasters that have been wreaking havoc upon this company for the past six or seven years at this point. It took me over a week to research and write this episode, and I'm just now sitting down here and filming this, and all I can think about is what is going to happen if the YouTube gods get angry at me and end up, you know, demonetizing this or something else happens because we're going to be talking about some very spicy and dark things. So I know that you will hear this on the internet a lot, but if you could go ahead and do me a favor and like this video, do anything you can to interact with it just to help me in the algorithm, I would personally appreciate it because I don't know what is going to happen with this. And if the video does end up getting demonetized and all my effort goes down the drain, I would hope that you all would check out my Patreon to help support me. But speaking of support, Boeing is basically on life support at this point. If you all have not heard about what has been going on at Boeing for the last several years, then please allow me to enlighten you because this gets really stupid really fast. In the very first week of 2024, a Boeing 737 MAX 9 passenger jet lost a rear door plug in mid-flight, terrifying the people on board. The large door plug plummeted into the backyard of a high school science teacher in Portland, Oregon. And after this whole thing happened, the Federal Aviation Administration had to order the grounding of similarly configured Boeing 737 MAX 9 aircraft for weeks. As the FAA would say at the time, quote, this incident never should have happened and it cannot happen again. Which of course, when we go and look at this right now, we would think, yes, of course, that is a very obvious be a statement, but you know, who am I to judge? I mean, just take a look at this article that's talking about the door being found. I mean, come on. You can see the door right here in the quote that comes from the individual teacher. The trees broke the fall like an airbag would, said Bob Sauer, a science teacher at Catlin Gavel School, so it didn't hit the ground very hard. Sauer heard about the incident Friday, but didn't check his garden until Sunday after a friend told him a cell phone from the flight had been found on a nearby street. So when he pulled out a flashlight and noticed something white in the tree when he walked out into his garden, there it was was just the door to the plane. He said that if the door had hit the house, it would have been very bad, which yes, yes, it would have. It would have been a disaster. But what is even more insane about this entire thing is that not only is this crazy, but this is not an isolated incident, not by a long shot. Even now, the thing that would go and inspire this video in the first place to be created is not this particular accident, but rather a significantly darker possibility with Boeing. The death of a Boeing whistleblower. Now, my friends, when I go into all of this, I'm not going to speculate. I'm not going to give you any ideas of what is going on, but everything that we are going to be talking about over the course of this video, coupled with the fact that this whistleblower has died, means that all of this is just a little bit too suspicious here for my taste. It's something that really does seem off, to put it mildly. For those of you who have not heard what is going on, police in Charleston, South Carolina are investigating the death of John Barnett, a former Boeing quality control manager who became a whistleblower when he went public with his concerns about the serious safety issues in the company's commercial airplanes. This guy died, and his body was found in a Holiday Inn parking lot in Charleston. This being one day after he had testified in a deposition related to the string of problems that he says that he identified at Boeing's plant where he once helped inspect the 787 Dreamliner aircraft before delivery to customers. At the time that all this was going on, Barnett was quite literally in the middle of giving deposition testimony in his whistleblower retaliation case against Boeing when he died. According to his lawyers talking about the whole thing, he was in quote, very good spirits and really looking forward to putting this phase of his life behind him and moving on. We didn't see any indication that he would take his own life. No one can believe it. Which, yeah, I can understand why, considering the context of everything that we're going to be going into. The police would say that officers were sent to the hotel in order to conduct a welfare check after people were unable to get in contact with Barnett, who had traveled to Charleston in order to testify in his lawsuit against Boeing. And upon their arrival, officers would discover a male inside of a vehicle suffering from a wound to the head. I'm not even sure, considering that I'm talking about this on YouTube, whether or not I can say the exact words in that scenario, but you all know what it is that I mean. He was pronounced dead at the scene naturally, and the Charleston County coroner would state that it appeared to be a self-inflicted wound, which is very convenient for Boeing in this case. I'm going to kind of have to leave it at that. Charleston police would say that detectives are actively investigating the case and are awaiting a formal cause of death as they try to determine the circumstances that surround this very unfortunate and ill-timed passing. The thing about this guy, what makes this so incredibly important and why we're going to need to talk about this is that Barnett had spent decades working for Boeing at its plants in Everett, Washington and North Charleston, South Carolina. And he had repeatedly alleged that Boeing's manufacturing practices had declined and that rather than improve them, managers had pressured 
workers to just not document potential defects and problems, which we're going to be seeing a lot of here shortly. Barnett had made international headlines in April of 2019 when he and other former Boeing employees went and spoke to the New York Times about what he called shoddy manufacturing problems at Boeing. In addition to these shoddy manufacturing practices, he accused the company of adopting a culture that prioritized raw numbers and profits over quality, and by extension from that, passenger safety and their very lives. As he would say to the newspaper, as a quality manager at Boeing, you're the last line of defense before a defect makes it out to the flying public. And I haven't seen a plane out of Charleston yet that I'd put my name on saying that it's safe and airworthy. By the time that that article had appeared, Barnett had already filed a whistleblower complaint against Boeing, saying that his attempts to raise quality and safety problems had been ignored, and then instead of being lauded and helped and aided to fix these issues, instead he was punished for continuing to flag them. So he went and filed a whistleblower complaint against Boeing in early 2017, and his case against the company was heading towards a trial this June. As his family would say about the matter, quote, he was looking forward to having his day in court and hoped that it would force Boeing to change its culture. About the entire thing, he would say, and I quote, that's what my story is about, is telling my story enough to where the right people get involved to make sure that these airplanes are made correctly, because the 787 carries 288 passengers plus crew. So the last thing I want to do is wake up in the morning and see a 787 has gone down because of one of the problems that he identified. I mean, it just keeps me up at night, he would say. And the unfortunate reality is going down seems to be a real possibility with Boeing aircraft of late. The reason that I bring all of this up, the reason that I'm talking about any of this is that the recent almost disaster is not the first accident that Boeing has had of late. No, rather this whole thing is just one of a series of accidents that are happening, possibly because of the issue that that whistleblower was trying to bring to light, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. To that end, what it is that I'm going to be doing here is that I'm going to be needing to talk about a bit of the history of Boeing, but we're not going to be doing a deep dive into that. I'm going to have to give you all a quick summary in order to catch you up to speed on this giant of aviation, because that is one of the key and important details as to why these problems that we are happening now are, well, happening right now. Also, everyone, before we continue with the video, I just wanted to thank everyone that has been booking the early bird spots for the trip that I'm going to be leading up here to Germany and Austria this November. The spots are rapidly disappearing, and I am getting more and more excited to be able to explore the German and Austrian Christmas markets with all of you. For those of you who haven't signed up yet, I would recommend doing so because the first eight people to sign up do get a $200 discount, which is something that is really helpful. And a lot of those spots are already taken, so you should probably secure it while you can. If Germany and Austria aren't really your speed, I'm also going to be leading a trip here to Peru, which there are still some spots available for that. And if none of those trips are possible for you, then I am also getting into LARPing. So if you want to join me in like a fantasy battle and start thwacking people with foam swords, well, I'm going to be participating in the Reckoning here in uh, in Kentucky. The links to all these things as well as Discord are down in my description, so by all means, go ahead and click that, and if you have any questions, just... So first off, Boeing itself is a pretty old company. It started with a partnership between a Seattle Timberman and yachtsman, William E. Boeing, and U.S. Navy Lieutenant George Conrad Westervelt, who was an engineer. The first two planes that the company would build were seaplanes, the Model B&W. Westervelt would then be transferred to the East Coast before the first flight would take place on June 15th, 1916, and then on July 15th, 1916, Boeing would incorporate the business as the Pacific Aero Products Company, which a year later became the Boeing Airplane Company. After the United States would then enter World War I, the military needed naval training planes, so Boeing would ship two Model Cs to Pensacola, Florida, and the Navy was so impressed with these that they would end up ordering 50 more. That was going to be Boeing's first foray into military contracts, something that is exceptionally lucrative and people have literally died for or become up. But okay, no, all of you who are watching this right now, you are not here for a complete history of Boeing. That would be an entirely different video, so we're going to have to speed through all of this in rapid order, but it's important for me to specify where the company started and how its first big break was military contracts. So we're now going to move through this whole thing in rapid order. So okay, World War happens then, and Boeing and other aircraft companies around the world explode in production and success. Unfortunately for them, the war then ends, you know, the horrifying thing that was World War One, and all all of those companies that started to produce these planes failed without major buyers to have during wartime. Boeing, though, did not. 20 years later, almost the exact same thing then happens during World War II, and Boeing brings us some very lovely stuff, such as the B-17 Flying Fortress and the B-29 Super Fortress. Very lovely stuff. 
Though I have to say the irony of Boeing going back to its roots and dropping doors instead of bombs on people is um, very ironic and funny to me. Still though, the war ends and ultimately, once again, most companies slow down and go out of business, but Boeing does not. And they would go on to then develop the world's first successful commercial jet, the 707-120. Something that would massively propel the company to dominance in the aviation market. Over the next several decades past this point, Boeing would either outlast or just buy out all of its competitors until really only one was left, Airbus. Now, for anyone who has flown a plane internationally, you know what it is that I'm talking about. Airbus is one of those common things that is going to and around Europe. Airbus was established as a consortium of European plane makers in 1970, and by late 1990, Boeing and Airbus effectively had a global duopoly in large commercial airplane manufacturing. There really was no one that could compete with them. And for those of you who do not realize when I specify this, monopoly is of course when one company would control something, but a duopoly, as the name suggests, is two. So that's it. In terms of options, most airlines have to choose between either Boeing or Airbus. Like, that that's really it. These two forces combined have over 90% of the commercial jet market. There is really no other power that is capable of competing with them. Right now, at the moment that I'm making this, there are efforts by some companies in other areas of the world, like China, to combine multiple multiple companies together to be able to compete with them, but really, these two are the dominant forces. They are. There's really no other options. In 2003, Airbus for the first time would end up delivering more airplanes than Boeing, but then in 2012, Boeing would regain the lead in jet deliveries. But since that year, Airbus has steadily booked more orders. And that discrepancy is something that has only become even more pronounced since 2019 for reasons that we are going to be getting into here in just a second. But the reason that I need to explain a little bit of the history of Boeing here, the reason why I talked about all of this is because you who's watching need to understand that for decades there have really been no other options for people to choose. You have two entities that control the market. And just like what ends up happening in politics, this means that there is a very real possibility that they become complacent and everything goes crap. And so for that crap to hit the fan, or in this case the jet engine, we're going to need to go back to the beginning. Although I said the year 2019, Boeing major troubles began in 2018, with the first major failure of its new flagship aircraft, the 737 MAX, with Lion Air Flight 610. Lion Air Flight 610 would take off from Jakarta's Sukarno Hatta International Airport at 6.20 a.m. on October 29th, 2018. Less than 13 minutes later, it would smash into the sea, and no one on board was going to survive. The events that would take place are as follows. At 6.18 a.m., Flight 610 was given clearance to take off from Sukarno Hatta International Airport. On board were 189 people, of which 181 were passengers, two were pilots, and six flight attendants. Before the plane took off, the crew had noted that the weather conditions on the route were good. Everything seemed fine, just a normal day, until it wasn't. At 6.20 a.m., unusual readings were recorded while still on the ground, less than 30 seconds before takeoff. Two displays in the cockpit recorded different wind speeds, while the plane's two angle of attack sensors, which measure its orientation in the air, disagreed by a very substantial 21 degrees. The plane then went on to experience a control column stick shaker warning, this being something which physically shakes the plane's controls to alert the pilots of a potential stall. This would continue for most of the flight. The plane would go on to sound a takeoff configuration configuration warning, a generic alert which flags potential problems. The report that would come after would say that the captain had queried the alert, but it gives no further detail about how this went down. At 40 seconds past 6.20 a.m., the plane would take off, and problems would begin immediately. Four seconds into the flight, sensors would start recording two different airspeeds. The first officer would ask the captain what the problem was and if they should turn back, and he did not respond. At 6.21 a.m., the first officer would then tell the captain that onboard sensors were giving two different altitude readings, more than 200 feet apart. The captain would speak with an air traffic controller in the terminal, who said that they needed to climb higher. The altimeter on the captain's primary flight display would indicate that they were at 340 feet, while the first officers would indicate that they were at 570 feet. At 28 seconds past 6.21 a.m., the first officer would ask the controller to confirm the altitude of the plane. The controller would say that it was 900 feet, 
feet, while on the plane, one display said 790 feet, and the other said 1,040 feet. This discrepancy would continue even after the captain and controller would agree that the plane should climb to 5,000 feet. The plane would still show two different speeds, and sensors could not seem to agree on how high the plane actually was. At 48 seconds past 6.22 a.m., sensors on the plane would radically disagree about its angle of attack. One would say that the plane was flying with its nose pointing 18 degrees up, the other saying that it was flying with its nose three degrees down. And that's something that just for a moment here I should specify, angle of attack sensors compare the angle of the wings to the direction of the plane, this being something that is needed in order to establish the orientation of the plane in the sky, so whether or not it is going up or down. At 4 seconds past 6.23 a.m., the control column stick shaker again warned of a possible stall. The plane warns of both too much speed and yet at the same time, not enough speed. At 15 seconds past, an automatic system on board the plane begins to force its nose down, activating for 11 of the next 17 seconds. At 27 seconds past 6.25 a.m., the plane's MCAS system would begin to activate. In six and a half minutes time, it will have crashed the plane. The automatic safety system of the MCAS being the very thing that would ultimately end up destroying it, which I'm going to need to explain here in a second. The MCAS was something that was meant specifically to stop the 737 MAX from stalling, counteracting a tendency for the nose to drift upwards because of the new design of the plane and the engine positioning by forcing it back down. Which, okay, that is understandable, but the truly crazy thing about this is that Boeing did not mention the MCAS system, what it is or how to manage any malfunctions, anything like that, in the flight manual for the pilots. So these guys that were flying this plane had no idea what was happening. Every single time that they corrected the plane to point up, the MCAS would just point it back down until eventually the plane would rapidly descend and ultimately crash. The entire ordeal must have been truly terrifying and confusing. As I had already stated before beginning of the section, the entire thing would end in disaster. Every single person on board would not survive, and the disaster would very obviously create much international attention and outcry directed towards Boeing. On the 29th of October, Indonesia's transportation ministry would order all of the country's airlines to conduct emergency inspections on their 737 MAX 8 aircraft. The ministry would also launch a special audit on Lion Air to see if any problems existed with its management system, which sounds at first as though they're going to find what is wrong, but no, they don't. That doesn't happen. The transportation ministry would instead announce that all Indonesian Boeing 737 MAX 8 aircraft were airworthy, and they were allowed to resume normal operations on the 31st of October. People were obviously very shocked and angry by the entire thing. A lot of death occurred specifically because of this. But this was a freak accident, right? There was no way that something like this would happen again, right? Except that it did. In March of 2019, an Ethiopian Airline Max would also crash, taking out all 157 people that were on board. Now, my friends, for those of you who are watching or listening to this episode, I'm not going to go into all the details of this one for reasons that are going to sound very obvious to anyone who is listening in just a second. Ask yourself if any of these things sound familiar. Flight 302 was scheduled for an international passenger flight from Addis Ababa to Nairobi. The aircraft would take off from Addis Ababa at 8.38 a.m. local time with 149 passengers and eight crew on board. At one minute into the flight, the first officer, acting on instructions of the captain, would report a flight control problem to the control tower. Two minutes into the flight, the plane's MCAS system would activate, pitching the plane into a dive towards the ground. The pilots would struggle to control it and manage to prevent the nose from diving further, but the plane continued to lose altitude. The aircraft would ultimately disappear from radar screens and it would crash at almost 8.44 a.m., six minutes after takeoff. The aircraft would impact the ground at nearly 700 miles per hour, and there were no survivors. Now let me ask you, does that sound familiar? In the immediate aftermath of the incident, the world panicked, and for very good reason. This was the second MAX 8 accident in less than five months after the crash of Lion Air Flight 610. Within a single day of the accident happening, MAXs across the entire globe were being grounded, with the very first nation to take action on this being China on March 11th. This was then followed in quick succession the next day on March 12th by Singapore, India, Turkey, South Korea, the European Union, Australia, and Malaysia. Almost across the board, these planes were being shut down, but interestingly enough, initially the United States declined to ground its own flights, with the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA, claiming that there was no reason to do so. This, however, would change very quickly, and the order was reversed on March 13th, with groundings being ordered despite Boeing CEO Dennis Muhlenberg's public assurances that the planes were safe and a phone conversation with President 
Trump at the time in which he, quote, reiterated to the president our position that the Max aircraft is safe. The world, though, did not buy it. And it definitely wasn't true. Unfortunately for Boeing, their new golden goose was now more of a lame duck. And the fallout from this was immediate and very rapid. By April of 2019, the Federal Aviation Administration would form an international team to review the safety of the 737 MAX. Boeing at the same time would have to cut its monthly production by nearly 20%, but that was light in comparison to what they were going to have to do after. Things would end up getting so bad that by July of 2019, Boeing would post its largest ever quarterly loss, something along the lines of 2.5%. $0.9 billion as revenues collapsed over 35%. It reached a point that the very viability of the 737 MAX program itself was at stake, that everything could be lost. Obviously, something would need to be done and done fast. So, fast forwarding to September of 2019, Boeing's board of directors would create a permanent safety committee to oversee development, manufacturing, and operation of its aircraft. That very next month in October of 2019, Boeing would fire Kevin McAllister, who was the top executive of its commercial airplanes division. And instead, on October 30th, the Boeing CEO, Dennis Muhlenberg, would have to testify before U.S. Congress committees, defending Boeing's safety culture and denying any knowledge of any kind of internal messages or anything wrong in which the Boeing's former chief technical pilot had said that he had unknowingly lied to regulators and voiced his concerns over the MCAS system. Boeing was in deep water at this point and it was only going to get worse. On the 26th of November 2019, the Federal Aviation Administration would revoke Boeing's organization designation authorization, which is a lot of things to say there, but essentially this was their ability to issue airworthiness certificates for individual MAX airplanes. Yes, essentially what that means is that prior to all this happening, the company itself was able to say whether or not its planes were airworthy, but at this point, the company could not be trusted to rate the airworthiness of its planes. And it's only going to get worse for Boeing. By January of 2020, Boeing would have to suspend 737 production, its biggest assembly line halt for more than 20 years. By January 9th, Boeing would release previous messages in which it claimed no flight simulator time was needed for pilots, and from that it would also distance itself from internal emails that had mocked airlines and the Federal Aviation Administration itself. On top of that, a number of these emails, a number of these internal messages were released that had their own people criticizing the 737 MAX design. And if that does not sound wild, I don't know what does. And if you haven't seen any of these messages, you need to look them up, because the most damaging messages include conversations among Boeing pilots and other employees about software issues and other problems with flight simulators for the MAX. Like, the employees appear to discuss instances in which the company specifically concealed such problems from the FAA during the regulator's certification of the simulators, which were in use in the development of the MAX, as well as in training for pilots who had not previously flown a 737. Like one of these exchanges that I have here says, and I quote, would you put your family on a MAX simulator trained aircraft? I wouldn't. This coming from one employee who would say it to a colleague in another exchange from 2018 before the first crash had occurred. No, the colleague responded. In another set of messages, employees would question the design of the MAX and even denigrated their own colleagues, saying, and I quote, this airplane is designed by clowns who are in turn supervised by monkeys. Which, wow, that is, that is a very strong statement to make. This being a statement that an employee would write in an exchange back in 2017, again, before any of these problems ended up occurring in the first place. But, this coming from an employee who would write this in an exchange in 2017, before the accidents had occurred, but it was that same year that the whistleblower who just died had come forward. In several instances, it was found that Boeing employees were just insulting the FAA officials reviewing the plane. In an exchange from 2015, a Boeing employee would say that a presentation that the company gave to the the FAA was so complicated that for the agency officials and even himself, it was, quote, like dogs watching TV. Several employees seemed very occupied with limiting training for airline crews in order to fly the plane, which is something that if they would manage to do would be a significant victory for Boeing that would very greatly benefit the company financially. In the development of the MAX, Boeing had actually promised to offer Southwest Airlines a discount of $1 million per plane if regulators required 
against simulator training because simulator training is very expensive and this is not something that companies typically want to do. In an email that had come from August of 2016, there was a marketing employee at the company who was extremely happy with the news that regulators had approved a short computer-based training for pilots who had flown the 737NG, which was the predecessor to the MAX, instead of requiring simulator training. Quote, you can be away from an NG for 30 years and still be able to jump into a max? Love it! This is a big part of the operating cost structure in our marketing decks. Because yes, that's what is more important. Dollars versus actual safety in people's lives. My friends, the unfortunate reality is that requiring simulator training can be costly for airlines, and even after the crashes, Boeing would tell the FAA that it was not necessary. It was not until even more would go down that Boeing would say that it would recommend simulator training for pilots who would fly the MAX. And it's at this point that things are relatively quiet for the next several months. By May of 2020, Boeing would resume 737 MAX production, but this being at a very low rate. And in June of 2020, Boeing would begin a series of long-delayed flight tests of its redesigned 737 MAX with regulators at the controls. As all this is happening, in September of 2020, an 18-month investigation by a U.S. House of Representatives panel would find that Boeing had failed in its design and development of the MAX, as well as its transparency with the the FAA, and also at the same time that the FAA was not without blame, that it had failed in oversight and certification. The result of this would be that on January 7th of 2021, Boeing would settle to pay over $2.5 billion after being charged with fraud over the company's hiding of information from safety regulators, a criminal monetary penalty of $243.6 million, and $1.77 billion of damages to airline customers, along with a $500 million crash victim benefit beneficiaries fund. I also should have mentioned this at the same time since I was moving into 2021, but at the end of 2020, in December of it, the company would go and fire the CEO, Dennis Muhlenberg, the guy who had had to testify before Congress in the wake of everything that was happening. Now, that all being said, a slightly more positive development would end up occurring in January of 2021, as the European Union Aviation Safety Agency would approve the MAX's return to service in Europe. Asia, though, would be a little bit more hesitant, as in March of 2021, China China's aviation regulator would say that the major safety concerns with the MAX needed to be properly addressed before conducting flight tests. And honestly, for very good reason too, because guess what? Only a month later, in April of 2021, Boeing would have to halt 737 MAX deliveries after electrical problems regrounded part of the fleet. Airlines would end up pulling dozens of MAX jets from service a week after Boeing Company had warned of a production-related electrical grounding problem in a backup power control unit that was situated in the cockpit on some recently built airplanes. Since that moment, suspected grounding problems had been found in two other places on the flight deck. These included the storage rack where the affected control unit is kept, and the instrument panel that is facing the pilots. Around 20% of the total amount of planes were affected by this issue. And all of that that we are talking about, my friends, that is just the technical side of things. As all of this is going down, investors in the company, in Boeing, are naturally very unhappy with the company. Because for those of you who can see the image that is behind me here, this right now is the current stock of Boeing, which has actually climbed, you know, in, in recent years after, well, everything that I'm talking about. However, that is still a far cry from what it was about four or five years ago. Investors were naturally very unhappy when they saw their stock value plunge from $340 per share in February of 2020 to a single month later when it was worth only $95. US dollars. That is a lot of lost value. And so in November of 2021, current and former Boeing company directors reached a 237 point $5 million settlement with its shareholders to settle lawsuits over safety oversights of the 737 MAX, which, naturally speaking, was costing them a lot of money. Fast forward a bit of time then, and over all of 2022, Boeing is consistently missing deadlines with the Federal Aviation Administration. Boeing did not provide complete documentation in the certification review process for the 737 MAX 7, and according to reports by the Wall Street Journal and Reuters, the Federal Aviation Administration told Boeing that some of the key documents that the manufacturer had provided were not complete, while others needed reassessing for human factors assumptions. The news outlets would cite a letter from the FAA to Boeing dated October 12, 2022, and in it, the agency would say that some of the reviews could not be completed due to, quote, missing and incomplete information regarding human factor assumptions in catastrophic hazard conditions. Boeing had already by this point missed other submission deadlines in the certification review process for the 737 MAX 7, and it needed 
needed to get the certification for the Max 7 first before it could get approval for the larger Max 10. When all this was going down, if Boeing had failed to get the Max 7 and larger Max 10 approved by the FAA by December 31st, 2022, then it would have had to equip both variants with a modernized flight crew alerting system to meet additional safety requirements as per the new Aircraft Certification Safety and Accountability Act, the SCSAA, which would have been implemented on January 1st, 2023. The problem with installing literally any kind of system in an airplane is that it's inevitably going to be very expensive, something that Boeing, naturally speaking, from everything that we've talked about in this episode so far, did not want to do, so they ended up going with the arguably cheaper option. They ended up just lobbying Congress to give them an extension on their exemption, which in turn was granted. Now, pilots of aircraft naturally opposed this, saying that Boeing should install the most modern alerting systems instead to help rebuild trust in the manufacturer, but no, no, that, that did not happen. And so fast forward into 2023, and in April of that year, Boeing would have to pause deliveries of some 737 MAXs in order to deal with a new supplier quality problem involving non-compliant fittings. The problem, which would affect a portion of the 737 MAX family of airplanes, including the MAX 7, MAX 8, and MAX 8200 airplanes, were, quote, not a safety of flight issue, and in-service planes could still continue to operate. This being a statement that would directly come from Boeing. But despite the plans to release the planes in 2023, they were put further behind, and as a result, in July of 2023, Boeing's first delivery of the 737 MAX 7 was officially delayed to 2024. So we're done now, right? Right? No. No, of course not. Because very soon after, Boeing would identify a new 737 MAX supplier quality problem involving improperly drilled holes on the aft pressure bulkhead. The supplier involved was once again Spirit Aero Systems, which is actually the same company that had the fittings issue that we just literally talked about. This is a company that Boeing has been in the process of trying to buy for a while now and is a key supplier to them, responsible for shipping the 737 fuselages from its facility in Wichita, Kansas. Which is very obviously bad. And then, silence. Nothing really happens. That is, of course, until January of 2024. An Alaska Airlines flight traveling from Portland, Oregon to Ontario, California had to make an emergency landing in January of 2024 after a portion of the aircraft quite literally blew out mid-air. Alaska Airlines flight 1282 left Portland International Airport at 4.52 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. The aircraft would return to Portland and would manage to land safely a little before 5.30 p.m. Now, what I've been trying to do here over the course of this video is play as many of the videos of things as I possibly can without hopefully running into the angry YouTube gods, but you all understand what it is that I am talking about. Social media video appeared to show that one of the passenger window panels had been blown out, which you can literally see here. And the Federal Aviation Administration would say in a statement that the crew reported a, quote, pressurization issue. Both the FAA and the National Transportation Safety Board would say that they were launching investigations and that 171 MAXs were once again being grounded. The craziest thing about all of this is not just that a part of a plane blew out in mid-flight, it's that this plane, a Boeing 737 MAX 9, had just recently been delivered to the airline in October. This was a brand new plane, and that is not a good sign. As a result of this, Boeing was forbidden to increase output of the planes pending the investigation, and what did the investigation find? Well, the door panel that flew off on January 5th appeared to be missing four key bolts, according to the preliminary report from U.S. investigators. That's right, my friends. This was a brand new plane, and it was missing bolts. Now, how does that happen? Naturally speaking, lawmakers and the public around the country were angry, and they demanded answers. And so a six-week audit by the FAA of Boeing's production of the 737 MAX would follow, and when this would happen, they would find dozens of problems throughout the manufacturing process both at the place where they would assemble the plane itself and also at one of its key suppliers, which can you guess what company we're talking about? Oh, that's right, Spirit Aero Systems. The agency would announce that the audit had found, quote, multiple instances in which Boeing and their supplier, Spirit Aerosystems, had failed to comply with quality control requirements. For the portion of the examination that specifically focused on Boeing, the FAA had conducted 89 product audits, which is a type of review that looks at the aspects of the production process, and the plane maker would pass only 56 of the audits. That's right, out of 89, they would fail 33 of them. Along with this, they would account a total of 97 instances of alleged 
alleged non-compliance. At the same time that this would happen, the FAA would also conduct 13 product audits for the part of the inquiry that would focus on Spirit Aerosystems, which makes the fuselage or the body of the 737 MAX, and when they did this, only six of those audits resulted in a passing grade, with seven of them failing. Mind you, I want you all to think about this here for a second. Out of 13, six passed and seven failed, meaning it was more likely to fail than it was to pass. That's not good. At one point during the examination, the Air Safety Agency observed mechanics at Spirit using a hotel key card in order to check the door seal. The action was, quote, not identified, documented, called out in the production order. In another instance, the FAA would see Spirit mechanics apply liquid Dawn soap to a door seal as a lubricant in the fit-up process, according to the document. The door seal was then cleaned with a wet cheesecloth, the document said, noting that the instructions were vague and unclear on what specifications or actions are to be followed or recorded by the mechanic. When asked about the appropriateness of using a hotel keycard or Dawn Soap in these situations, a spokesman for Spirit called Joe Pacino would say that the company was, quote, reviewing all identified nonconformities for corrective action. Jessica Kowal, who is a spokeswoman for Boeing, would say that the plane maker was continuing to, quote, implement immediate changes and develop a comprehensive action plan to strengthen safety and quality and build the confidence of our customers and their passengers. Everything that I've talked about at this point is absolutely terrible, and in late February of 2024, the FAA would give the company 90 days to develop a plan for quality control improvements. And in response to that, the current CEO, Dave Calhoun, would say that we have, quote, a clear picture of what needs to be done, citing in part the audit findings. And so it is in the context of all of that, of every single thing that I have explained here today, that now a whistleblower of Boeing that was suing Boeing finds himself dead. And if you're wondering about the specific details of this lawsuit, a redacted version of it would read, quote, John M. Barnett, a long-term Boeing quality manager, alleges that throughout his seven-year tenure at Boeing South Carolina, he would make numerous ethics complaints about a deep-rooted and persistent culture of concealment at BSC, in which he and other quality personnel were pressured by Boeing upper management to violate Federal Aviation Administration standards and regulations, as well as Boeing's processes and procedures by not properly documenting and remedying defects. Barnett refused to bend to the pressure and continually raised issues that needed to be properly documented and addressed. In retaliation for his complaints and identifying issues that needed to be properly documented and addressed, Barnett was given low performance management scores, he was separated from his team, and moved to other areas in the plant, and blacklisted and blocked from transferring to other Boeing divisions outside of BSC. All of this that I'm talking about at the time here is specifically the allegations that the lawsuit is making. I'm not saying that this is 100% certain of what is happened, but these are the allegations that are being made. Quote, in addition, he was subjected to a gaslighting campaign in which he was harassed, denigrated, humiliated, and treated with scorn and contempt by upper management, which was calculated to discourage him and others from raising such issues and complying with the law. Based on the totality of the circumstances, such conduct amounted to a hostile work environment and it led to Barnett's constructive discharge. And here's how insane this entire thing is. The lawsuit that was filed to the U.S. Department of Labor says that in January of 2017, Barnett was notified that his name was one of 49 that were listed in an email that was on a supervisor's desk that was entitled Quality Managers to Get Rid Of. I mean, it sounds ridiculous, right? It sounds completely unbelievable. I mean, who would be so incredibly dumb as to do something like that, to have something like that title? And then if you watched everything over the course of this video, you'd probably think, well, okay, maybe it's, it's Boeing, so it's possible. The lawsuit would state that Barnett would, quote, continue continually object to Boeing creating and maintaining a program that was not approved by the FAA that allowed mechanics to inspect and approve their own work, something known as the multifunction process performer. In one instance, in 2012, a supervisor would, quote, begin pushing Barnett to work outside of the proper procedures, and when he emailed another supervisor to complain, that individual, quote, told Barnett orally that he did not believe him, and after that, no investigation was done. The lawsuit would also describe how Barnett would complain about countless instances of parts being stolen from one airplane and then installed on an incomplete airplane without any kind of documentation, any traceability or engineering review, and how in June of 2014, he would submit a complaint about another manager who was spying on him. Boeing, when asked to respond to the lawsuit, would tell the news, quote, we are saddened by Mr. Barnett's passing, and our thoughts are with his family and friends. And that's it.
no, seriously, that's it. That That is really it. That's the end. Nothing else has happened yet at this point, at least not that I'm able to see here anyway. The unfortunate thing about the situation is that there are many dark secrets about this entire ordeal. Things that more than likely are never going to actually come to light. Considering the amount of traveling that I myself have had to do here for my job and how much more I'm going to be doing in the future, I'm only going to say this here at the end, that if something should happen to me, I ask that you remember this video. Thank you all very much for watching. This has been Stakui with the History of Everything podcast YouTube channel, and I will say this here, this video took a long time to write, research, and make. So anything that you all do, could do to like, to comment, to subscribe, any of that really does help me, and I really do appreciate it. I will say that in the end, though I don't normally give my opinions here on things, that this is what happens. This is what happens when a company effectively has no competitors whatsoever. Quality slips at the expense of people's lives, all in the pursuit of profit. There is a reason as to why when I say that this is the history of everything, that we will go back into the history of everything and explain how it is that we got here to where we are today. Everything has a story, even if unfortunately, not all of those are pleasant. Thank you all again for watching, and I will see you next time. Goodbye, my friends.